In a previous video, I introduced the idea of option by context interaction, a generalization of breeders' genotype by environment interaction, as a framework for thinking about and doing research in support of smallholder farmers. Now I'll explain some of the principles of study design that this leads to. The classical breeders' tool to measure and understand genotype by environment interaction is the multi-environment trial. Here I've represented one schematically. Nine environments were selected, here represented as points on a map of rainfall in Ethiopia. At each location, 16 varieties of genotypes, G, were compared in a standard randomized block design and crop production was measured. Looking at the elements of this study, we see four things. First, there is the diversity of options to compare, in this case the 16 varieties. Secondly, there are the environments in which they are compared, selected to sample the variability within the project domain. Third component is the indicators of performance which we're using. These were set by the study and project objectives. And finally, there are the details of the design at each place, chosen to make the study efficient and valid as well as practical. I'll now dig deeper into three of these and show how they can be used within a more general options by context interaction problem. The methods that we use are really very diverse. They do include the standard researchers multi-environment trials, but they also include a range of other options including farmers trials, such as those described in participatory plant breeding and participatory technology development schemes. We have randomized controlled trials of other sorts of interventions. These days we can do experiments sometimes in computers using simulation models, for example whole farm simulation models or crop weather simulation models. Modeling has been uh, also combined with participatory research in the form of participatory modeling and scenario exploration. There are pseudo-experiments when we don't have full control over what is compared with what, where, and the full range of observational studies and surveys of all types. Each of these will be most efficient at generating information for option by context interaction if the design principles are used. The first of these principles concerns choosing the context in which to work. The key element here is that you have to hypothesize what the dimensions of context are which are going to be important. They might be social, economic, ecological dimensions. And you need to propose or hypothesize which ones of these are going to have strongest interactions with the options that you're studying. Hypotheses will be based on literature, on local knowledge, and in your understanding of the processes involved. When you've identified those hypothesized dimensions which are important, you'll probably fall into one or more of three groups. First, there are those which I call mappable. These are ones for which you can point to a location on a map and predict what will be there, like mean rainfall on the map of Ethiopia. You can then use these maps to define the strata from which you will sample, or to define gradients along which you will sample. Second, there are those which are predictable but not mappable. They're predictable in the sense we know their status before starting the study. An example would be if we're interested in the interaction of an option with the gender of the head of the household. This is something that can be determined before we start the study. But you can't point to a map and say what the gender of the head of the household will be. If we have these predictable contexts, then we can use stratified random sampling to select where we do the study, or we might use purposeful sampling, where we deliberately select some of each type. And finally, there are those which are unpredictable. An example of an unpredictable one would be the pest and disease status in a particular season. We don't know what that's going to be before we do the study. For these, we need to use random sampling, or in some cases, self-selection process. Once we have chosen those contexts to work in, we will design the study, collect the data, interpret it, and reflect, and perhaps go back and refine the hypothesis and repeat the cycle. The important point 
is that this process of choosing contexts to work in, the location, the people, socioeconomic and ecological niches that they represent, this is part of the research enterprise and it should be driven by the requirements of the research, whatever one of those study types we're using. The second idea I want to explore is where the options we're using in the study come from. And here we can learn from breeders. Breeders aim to generate variety and diversity to work with, and they use a number of tools for doing that. They will use wide-scale collections of the crop they're working on. They will use crossing and recombination to generate novel mixtures of the genes that they represent. They might include wild relatives to increase the diversity of the genetic base, and they might even use transgenics to be able to transfer genes from one species to another. If we think about a more broader collection of social, institutional and technical options that we might study, then I believe there are parallels to each of these steps. If we think about a right wide scale collection, then what we're talking about is looking broadly at the current practices of using local knowledge and interrogating the global literature. If we think about crossing and recombination, we can do something similar by, for example, arranging exchange visits between farmers working within different contexts. And we also have exchange visits, of course, between scientists. And these days, there are many ways in which scientists are able to exchange ideas other than having a meeting through various networks. I'm not sure quite what the parallel of the wild relatives is, but I do know of examples where including some seemingly wacky ideas in a research has actually led to some very important outcomes. And perhaps the parallel to using transgenics is being able to take elements of an approach from one discipline and transplant them into what we're working on. This, of course, doesn't answer the questions which of all the options we might generate we should be including in a particular study. I'll save that as a topic for another talk. So, where do we go from here? I think there are two things we need to look at next. Work out what this means in practice. How should we actually set about the process of designing these studies? And maybe we can provide some case studies and tools to help researchers implement the ideas.